four, four, so a lot of stuff. Um, you have to watch WGN, they say. A lot of baby. Problem? I'm very dead. So as our friends are good, I'm doing my lot of baby impersonation. Thank you, Alexander. Part of the archive is in his 
basement, part in the mountain, part in, uh, in the barn in the countryside. And his, uh, his work is to rearrange the archive in a constant way um, and uh, uh, rethinking about uh, what he has done and what he's doing, etc. etc. So, and he hates to interviews. Um, so I kept going back to see him and talk to him and uh, every time I got a new story and then I went to check what he, were, what he told me and, and uh, did a lot of research, tried to interview his friends. Uh, then I got, I involved other friends of mine to keep to, to from this uh, work that is was becoming endless. Of Francois, and we kept discovering the most amazing things, and, and this became eventually a show and a catalog. A show and a catalog that, uh, with this strange title, God and Co. Uh, God and Company, Francois Dacre, Beyond the Bubble. So, Beyond the Bubble, because everybody seems to know the bubble, the environmental bubble. The drawings for a home is not a house. Um, and it's, I don't know how many times this image has been published. I don't know, thousands probably uh, of times. Um, and sometimes Francois is not even credited and is really annoyed by that. Um, but uh, we wanted to show who he was and, and the other incredible career he did uh, before and after this uh, encounter with Bannon. And so I need to put this encounter uh, with Bannon in, Bannon in a context. Um, so the title, uh, Why God and Co? Because this is the way uh, Francois used to sign his work and, uh, for a period of his life. Um, and it's sort of like saying, it, it says, it's, that it, it sort of means uh, uh, go denigre, go denigre. So it was like saying to, in, telling to himself, go, 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 go. Uh, but actually people were writing to him, uh, like Bana was writing to Francois, and the letter started with, dear God. So people were like, <laughs> so he was God. And he got also, uh, and he still has it, um, a credit card uh, with his company name. Uh, so at the time, in, we are talking about the 60s, it was still possible to get credit cards uh, in your, with the name God and uh, Company. So that's why we use this, um, God and Company, um, the title, and Beyond the Bubble. So beyond the bubble and before the bubble. So where is it coming, Francois Dallegre? Where was it coming from before finding himself in Montreal? Uh, Francois is French, but he was born in Morocco from an engineer. Um, his father was an engineer for the Trans-Saharan Railway. Um, and the family came back to France uh, immediately after the war. And he was, um, and started to study um, architecture, but with some doubt. He was not really sure he wanted to do architecture. And he called the Beaux-Arts, which at the time was, uh, it was started, as you can see, it started in 1959 which you sort of imagine is like a, should have been and was a most amazing period um, to be in Paris, but the Ecole of Beaux-Arts was very conservative and, and especially in architecture. Um, Francois told us that basically what they were doing, they were um, doing drawings of the orders. So, um, Ionic, Corinthian, Doric, uh, so this is what they were doing. Um, and play stupid games, uh, like the one that you see here, of uh, initiations of the new students. But he was not really convinced of doing that, and, uh, and he kept exploring other venues and possibilities. For example, he wanted to become an industrial designer, and he went to interview uh, Raymond um, Lowy, um, one of the great um, representatives of a streamlined style, and other things that he did, uh, he had a very strange relationship with his mother. He went to visit Salvador Dali um, in Spain. He went with his mother to visit Salvador Dali in 1960, and he went to visit before a college with his mother, Auguste Perret. Very strange uh, association and exploration. So he was thinking of becoming a, an industrial designer, but he was also looking at artists. He, he kept in touch. He uh, was sort of adopted by Salvador Dali. Um, they kept meeting. Um, 
in France, but also in New York, but well, Francois moved to New York, this is like a, a car. And he was in, uh, completely in love with automobiles. Um, and he, actually, he wanted to be a collector of Bugatti, uh, nothing less, which is not a fantastic car, but very expensive. He had said much. He actually bought a Bugatti at a certain point in 61, um, but uh, never used it. It was there uh, just for display. And uh, this passion for automobiles and Bugatti signed his first public appearance and explosion, actually, as a presence in the art scene of Paris in uh, um, 1962. In 1962, he was invited by two, uh, probably the most avant-garde and famous gallery in Paris. At the time, it was an Iris-Claire gallery. To, um, to, uh, where he proposed a show of astrological automobiles. So he designed 12 automobiles, each corresponding to an astrological sign. Um, the drawings were like presented together with a sort of like a gigantic uh, reproduction of the Super Leo, so the automobile that corresponds to the sign of Leo. Um, and uh, the, um, the old show was presented actually as a total environment because uh, people entering the gallery of Iris Blert has to pay some money and enter through a turnstile, like a it corresponds to be all to the opening of a salon of the automobile of that year in, in Paris, and uh, there was a sort of soundtrack of an um, automobile race uh, in uh, Minneapolis. So it was sort of like sound um, environment that corresponded. And so, so, and actually, he was clear that invited also um, the Minister of Transportation of France to the opening of the exhibition. Um, and these are the automobiles designed for the show. And, and, and you can see it's like sort of retro futurism, uh, really strange uh, uh, design and drawings. So you have like 12 astrological signs. Why it was that? Because uh, Danny Gray was in a, into astrology, but also in his it is clear. Who was it is clear that invites uh, Daniel Gray to do this um, first show in Paris in 62? She was the gallerist of Yves Klum, uh, nothing less than um, Yves Klum. And uh, it is in the, the gallery of Yves Clerc that uh, Yves Klum did uh, the famous exhibition uh, The Void, um, the Vid. Um, and, uh, also uh, connected with experiments he was conducting, also in, suggested, recommended by Iris Clerc, he started to do the anthropometric performances um, in the late 50s, early 60s. And actually, François Galigré collaborated with him. This anthropometric performance, just to remind you briefly what it was, you know, he was using uh, girls as living uh, brushes to paint on the walls and on the floors. And the role of François Dalibé was to find the girls, which was interesting. <laughs> um, also, um, thanks to uh, Yves Klein and um, François met the, the, the couple of photographers that became really important for him later uh, in Montreal. He met the photographers that uh, was instrumental in realize, realizing one of the most famous performances of uh, Yves Klein, Les Sautes dans les Vides, The Deep Into the Void, which were like, uh, that was like a, this performance simulation when uh, Yves Klein pretended to jump into the void, but actually it was like jumping for a small you know, <laughs> wall uh, on, in the street. Anyway, Han Shank would become also the uh, a collaborator, a photographer of François Dalégré, uh, for whom photography became really an important tool um, in the production of his work. Who else was working at the, in the Iris Clert, uh, was part of the artist, of a group of artists exhibited by Iris Clert was um, Armand, that in answer to the exhibition Les Vides, 
the, the void of if plan did lead plan the full uh, exhibition and was um, is Jean Tanguelli did the, the first exhibition in Paris again in the gallery of Philistert. Also, David Ray was became also connected with Tanguelli. I'm going to come back to this. And the Marcantin, who was one of the first art artists um, to produce inflatable and to experiment with inflatables. This is a learning show he did again at the Hillsborough Gallery in '63 <coughs> of breathing um, sculpture. And you see a little bit uh, uh, a lot of his names uh, in a special show organized by Iris Clert. She was in trouble, she was always in, uh, in trouble with money. Um, and so she convinced her artists to, to do a sort of collective show. And where you can see on this publication um, edited by Iris Clert, by his, uh, his gallery, you see the, the sort of like uh, series of artists that were represented uh, that included François d'Alegre uh, that gave as part of his contribution to this collective exhibition one of his drawings of rockets, cities, of space cities. This is another one um, that was, he was realizing in the same year. So he was drawing space cities. This is 1963. Um, so he was Yes, working, uh, studying architecture at the Bazaar, but uh, basically his main activity was like being part of this art scene, um, very intense um, and very interesting um, in the early late 50s, early uh, 60s in uh, uh, Paris. And here you see Francois working in, in Paris as a student of architecture, and behind him see part of the work he was producing, you see, some of the astrological automobile and this amazing project uh, for what we would call the megastructure uh, to be realized in plastic, new materials. It's a gigantic pyramid of made of cells, uh, of um, habitations. This is like a, the, the section on one of the um, environmental bubbles that don't look like bubbles in this case. It's a, it's a beautiful um, uh, section on an um, apartment to be realized completely in plastic. This whole mega structure was supposed to be in plastic in materials, and including all the everyday objects to be inserted. So this is 1962, and in the same photographs behind the Francois in the same photograph of 1962, you see this other drawing that is going to be part of the drawings that is going to be that, that are going to illustrate uh, a home is not a house of um, the text of Bannon, a home is not a house, but he called Super Coupe de Long Weekend with the extension, the sort of caravan behind the automobile that he calls Unité d'habitation. And of course, it's like making a joke about the museum. Same here, same last year in the uh, spending in Paris, the Ray is also working on these machi this incredible machines, drawings of machines that completely prosthetics um, and cybernetics, and uh, using the, the very precise way this uh, uh, the idea of cybernetics. Um, so this is like a machine to for writing and talking uh, and registering, you know, registering what people talk, etc., etc. It's a completely prosthetic. And, and you see, it's the first example where you see actually uh, Francois designing these machines that are um, prosthetic machines and, uh, and they're designed for his uh, beginning with his own body. So his body is like the, uh, the sort of mannequin that support the, these prosthetic machines or that is going to activate these other machines, like this one, this uh, machine to cook for cooking of 62, or this crazy machine uh, that Francois hates to write and, and, and talk, but he has always invented crazy title. Um, uh, this is a machine to kick people in the ass 
and um, offend them in other general ways. Um, and it's uh, basically François Daigle, a pose where like, uh, it's, uh, it's going to appear, I don't know if you can see him. Yeah, he's there. Oh, okay, as you can see, again, it's the body of François is posing and it's going to be the man, the, the body, the human that is going to actuate this amazing machine that he's designing. This is a machine for public relations, and this is a machine to produce literature. Again, again with a commanding post, a commanding control post, that is going to be occupied by um, by the operator that usually is himself, is Francois himself. Who else he was like? Uh, Francois was not just uh, you know uh, meeting, talking, sharing experience, and uh, with the artists that were part of a you know artist um, <clears throat> working with his club. He was interested by another group of. Uh, um, artists that were <clears throat> doing research, connecting science and art, and they, they used to call themselves a group de recherche that is well, like a research group in visual, the visual arts. Um, these are, you see them here, and loosely connected with this group was also Nicolas Schaeffer. Nicolas Schaeffer is the artist, the first one that proposed the project for a cybernetic city. So uh, this was like Paris, the, con the context probably where, um, and in this sort of research that explore, um, that goes beyond that cinetic or kinetic art to explore the cybernetics, um, is the context that interests uh, um, Francois. Always to, to have Francois to admit to something is very, very difficult. But this is where he meets uh, Nicolas Schaeffer and uh, the context uh, that generates uh, this installation, this machine that is going to be um, on display in New York in 1966 uh, and it's called La Machine and it's actually a cybernetic machine and it's published in a key publication uh, by Jack Burnham <coughs> Beyond Modern Sculpture, The Effects of Science and Technology on the Sculpture of the Century. And uh, Burnham is interesting enough, is using this uh, installation of uh, uh, François Lavigne to explain the difference between, uh, or you know, the step beyond uh, kinetic art uh, to cybernetic. So it's using uh, François Lavigne to speak of cybernetic you know, as sort of a system of interaction between men and machines. And he's using this, um, this strange machine that still exists, is in, a, in the countryside in a bar, um, that produced music and light uh, in response to the movement of the uh, public in the, the gallery. So it's really an interactive uh, uh, machine system. That was realized, by the way, and it's very funny and interesting. Um, François de Degré used pieces parts of aluminum components uh, that were produced in uh, Montreal to uh, build the French pavilion for Expo 67. So it's all sort of recuperating these parts and doing this separate machines. So here we are already in New York and, and their great is uh, exposing in New York, is showing cybernetics machine in New York in 66. Um, but actually he arrives in New York in late 63 with Bernard Canton and who is really instrumental in introducing uh, François to the architectural milieu, the scene in New York is Peter Blake. And it's Peter Blake actually that is going to introduce, uh, uh, Peter Blake is the first one to publish the crazy machine of the degree in an uh, architectural journal. And he's going to introduce also François Dallegre to Rainer Banner. This, this is the connection. But, um, in fact, uh, he, he, François spends one year in New York and he's living in the Chelsea Hotel. 
and making friends with Freud and Schoenstein, Antigoro, etc., etc. So he was in, in contact with uh, all the pop art, and uh, one of the first things he's going to do in, uh, in Montreal is to open up the gallery, Galerie Labo, where it's showing and selling uh, pop art. <coughs> Anyway, here is the encounter with uh, the famous encounter that produced um, the famous piece of a home, the images for the famous piece, a home is not a house. Um, so, piece illustrated by Daigle. Piece illustrated of Daigle. And no, so all of this introduction is saying that Daigle does much more than just illustrating the idea of. Uh, Rainer Bannon, and I don't know how much Bannon, you know, was aware of Bannon is the, the relationship with of Bannon with artists is really strange and needs to be explored. He was very critical, for example, of Landart. He was not interested at all. Actually, he was extremely uh, critical. Um, but and, and yet, and you see how François Daligre was coming from the really the most extreme avant-garde of uh, Parisian. Uh, but, and it was also in touch with, you know, the pop art, etc., in, in, uh, in New York. And so, what, what is the contribution, really, of François to the description, like the conception of this iconic image, of, of this idea, uh, precisely that of the environmental bubble of a home that is not a house, that becomes something else, that is, is uh, you know, collection of machines, tools, instruments, apparatus that creates in a completely controlled and artificial environment. Of course, uh, François is designing all this uh, complex of machines and apparatus, but he's also designing the inhabitant of the bubble. And, and I think that this is really is the most interesting contribution of, um, of that event. Uh, be thinking and be visiting this uh, image because okay so what's the story who are the inhabitants of these bubbles okay you see two naked figures and one is uh, supposed to be Banham and the other one is Dalegre uh, but actually Banham uh, as you probably know um, refused to pose naked because he, he was embarrassed by his body so it's not the first architectural critic uh, that actually accepted to go to naked. Um, so Francois kindly, um, you know, used his own body <laughs> also for to uh, for Bannon. So so the, it's always the body of Francois Delegate that is repeated and multiplied in the bubble. Um, so the you know, so this is the inhabitant of the bubble is a really strange figure if you think about that. Okay, because it's a, it's a photo montage. Um, and, uh, you know, but there are a lot of recent essays about this. Who is the new habit? Is, is it a new figure, this inhabitant of the environmental bubble? Um, and a number of suggestions have been done. But if, if you read really carefully the text of Bannon, Bannon is always talking about the near future. He's always saying, Okay, I'm sort of like making a projection about things that are already present. In, in fact, Americans are already living in trailers, in caravans, in, in spaces, in nomadic places. Actually, you can, you know, even have a family that, uh, that inhabit this sort of new um, form of habitations, etc., etc. But actually, this is not what's happening in here. Like, you know, the inhabitant is actually a strange human being. Strange human um, that uh, is uh, is like a dyadic. And actually, to explain this human, who is this inhabitant? You have to to understand, you know, um, who is like uh, has offered us a possible definition of this inhabitant is not a dyadic. You know, German philosopher, this philosopher, the philosopher of spheres and bubbles, um, who talks of dyadic. Monadology as the form of modern and contemporary inhabitation. So it says that today we inhabit monads. Monads are bubbles, they okay, are spheres. So as and the inhabitant of these monads, of course, is like one person, it's one inhabitant. Okay, it's not a family, it's like so one formula actually used by 
Slotodax it says that we inhabit in connected isolation. That's the character of modernity, to be connected and isolated at the same time. So we inhabit monads that are spheres, that have no windows, and the inhabitant, this inhabitant is uh, dyadic in the sense that it is communicating with itself. So it's sort of like building them with the outside, with the outside, with uh, through instruments, media, so there is a communication, but basically this outer gamut, so it's basically building a lot social life inside these isolated bubbles, um, and creating this, uh, yeah, a multiple social life, basically multiplying itself, doubling itself. And actually I think, I think, it's a, uh, I think it's a rather believable um, interpretation. I think this is what Francois Tarigre is telling us, depicting this strange inhabitants of the bubble that are like a multiple version of his body with this fictional presence introduced of Bana that appears as only as a photomontage. And so it's like something from outside that comes inside as an So I think this is the great contribution and and we found in the process of excavating the basement and the attic of Francois, we found actually the original sketch uh, and drawings for uh, the home, the, the piece, a home is not a house, but we found also this, which is the photographs he produces uh, in preparation. And as you can see, it really did work a lot on, as you can see, for um, to, uh, you know, to, to create the inhabitant of the bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, of course, and it's progressive. I love this sequence. So, as you can see, how much investment was there, and, and, and precisely the role of photography in describing what is the inhabitant of the bubble, of the, the future of inhabitation. So, this dyadic uh, uh, monadology. Of this bubble. So dyadic monotology is an environmental bubble that can be described also as a technological uterus. Okay? It's a uterus, it's a womb, it's a, but technological. And it's interesting because this question of being pregnant or maternity and paternity is a subject that absolutely obsessed Francois Dadegre in, uh, in the 60s. But you see, if here you see an example, is the pregnant chair, and is the proud father of the pregnant chairs, or is designing strange things. Uh, I'm missing here, because, uh, yeah, it's also part of the way that uh, Francois was showing to us. These are, again, cybernetic machines that were designed for um, the Expo 67, um, but then reappears in different formats as toys or as uh, spaceships in a different, uh, this is again as a toy. At the same time, he was also designing this amazing um, place in Montreal, which was a total environment. This was a pharmacy, art gallery, restaurant, and discotheque at the same time. Um, it was on two floors. Uh, on the top floor, you found the art gallery, where he was selling Andy Warhol, uh, the pop artist, uh, but also people like Tech and Fluxus, very interesting uh, guys. Um, and Uh, it's sort of evident when you look at the 
um, the restaurant at Disco part of the of his Le Drag in Montreal, which is a responsive environment because uh, all the lighting and ventilation was operated by the people uh, by the people using the restaurants and the disco. So the stage that you see behind him from the ceiling represents the heating and ventilation. He was also still producing this amazing um, portfolios of intention for Latin America, which is the same journal that um, published the Hobbies of the House, like this one, Art Fiction, uh, with the artists of the future, where again we are in the, in the realm of the aesthetics. So the artist of the future, of course, is uh, François Dagnegre himself, um, uh, again using his body um, and, and photography to transform and transforming his body uh, in order to inhabit space and produce emotion. There we go. So it's like generating emotion <laughs> and radiation. He was at the same time working at the, uh, the, the entertainment section of Expo 67, organizing huge parties. And very fast. Though. And here he's working. And these are the photos I gave you for the presentation. <laughs> This here is working with Shunken Kenders, the, the photographer that we are working with uh, his clump for the leap into the void. Um, that we are like doing this strange form of uh, photography. So this is François Dalegre in his apartment uh, in uh, Montreal in the 60s. And these are amazing photographs talking about uh, domesticity and Well, same time is also doing actually real architecture. He's collaborating with Joseph Baker, and at the closing of the Expo 67, they proposed the, the realization of a sort of mega structure by the Metro, which is a sort of super mall that you can see here, uh, and also a sort of total environment with projection, music, uh, disco. Um, etc. Et that, um, that was supposed to be uh, directly connected to, uh, to the underground system of the new underground system, the subway system of Montreal. This project was published by Ban in, uh, in this book on uh, megastructure. He was also designing, things like that, and also uh, keeping exploring projects about inhabiting the space, space in habitation, uh, like this one that he developed with two neuropsychiatrists, uh, by Eddie Grant, and they developed this amazing apparatus for feeding babies into sp in space, living in space. So they call it Atlati Team, is how to feed babies in habitating space. And it's first part of this uh, exploration of the game, you know, space in habitation and procreation in, uh, into space and uh, generating new beings that are going to inhabit uh, the inhabitants of the future how into space again. So, so it, it's a uh, space paternogenesis and as I told you it was completely obsessed with paternity, mater maternity, uh, the generation of new beings that are coming out of form. And I um, remind you that the third volumes of Peter Slotus died on um, spheres is called exactly form. Again, more experiments uh, of the time. And it's said that I'm, I'm showing you, you know, it's, it's like a cascade, it's like a huge amount of production. Um, at the same time, it's also. Um, Working on a for television on a fiction western. He's designing the costume and uh, scenography and strange weapons like this one that he calls fusil à émotion. Uh, so a gun that produces emotion. And this fusil à émotion, that emotion, that emotion is, is going to reappear in a piece that he calls uh, Desertomania. Again, published in Art in America, um, where it says that this is where we have to inhabit, we have to inhabit the desert. Um, and it's talking of 
the desert before and after the nuclear explosion. And of course, it's like a, it's a kinder. It's like talking about it to describe the Tangini. And it's, uh, but a few years before, did a study for an end of the world number two um, near Las Vegas in Nevada with self-destructing big explosion, think of TV. And then again, it's a more like positive attitude, but it's like following on the steps. So that's the vision of the future, inhabiting positive and negative clouds. He was invited at the Aspen conference a couple of times by Bannon and invited to this uh, issue of Design Quarterly, uh, published in 1970, but was devoted to the notion of environment. And where you find all the big names of the, of the time. So, Anfar, Mark Kram, Mark Zoom, Telegram, Peter Eisenman, Hans Zucker, Craig Ojet, uh, and Fruchet, Super Studio. Um, and artists were uh, asked to respond to the notion of the environment, so entertainment environment, psychological environment, communication environment. And this is the answer of François Delegré. Um, so he's presenting um, what he calls okay, heaven ball. It's a total environment. And these are photographs of his wife, Judith, that was pregnant with twins. Obsession with maternity, uh, same way. So this is the response. This is the total environment. So it's this super pregnant wife. Uh, and again, talking about the notion of the environment and the multiple meaning of this notion in the 60s and the 70s. More experiment. This one was realized. They did actually with again with Baker. They did. Um, in a super shopping center in Kansas City in 72. This is a presentation. And here I'm like accelerating and getting to the 60s, 70s, and the 80s. And what happened to Francois Calegre and also what happened a little bit uh, to the culture, this exciting culture of that was the 60s and early 70s in Montreal uh, that sort of disintegrated. Um, um, after 1976, precisely, after the Olympics in uh, Montreal. And this is like a piece generated by Francois at the time. It's called the Cour Française. The Cour Française is a tool, actually, a drawing tool employed before the invention of parametric and digital design to design curves. Um, he realized that particular Cour Française in gold, and if you're a little bit familiar with Montreal, what you see is the construction of the Olympic Stadium that was the ruin of Montreal. Montreal took 20 years to pay for that stadium. And precisely for the tail of the stadium, and the, and the curve of the tail of the stadium um, actually follows the, the line of the Cour Française that uh, Francois is holding up. François is also in design part of the, the banks, uh, the benches, and the uh, um, lamps uh, for the Olympics, uh, and also some of like, the disc. This is one of his design. But in sometimes when it's becoming sarcastic uh, and, uh, and critical. Um, so more work on the 70s. This is a smoking machine that he designed because he was asked to design a, a brand of cigarettes called La Tetubase. And he designed this machine as advertisement for cigarettes. But it's, it's a contradiction because actually this machine smokes 12 cigarettes at the same time, I think. And you can see all the nicotine concentrating in the <coughs> Or he started to do this sort of things. And then again, it's, all, it's obvious that he's quoting. Uh, contemporary artist, uh, and is also making fun of contemporary architects uh, in uh, Montreal. So this is uh, this is called cheese graters, and uh, for sure it's like a sort of like uh, being sarcastic about this particular building in 
Monja, that, that people call also, which is the Rector, which is an island, so different versions. And, and here we are in the 80s, this, this is one of the last work that we did, decided to show in the exhibition, because then we find it's a fantastic uh, uh, form of criticism of postmodern. And I'm going to close with this uh, work that he calls the Villa de Monique. So you have to understand, this guy is coming from the avant-garde of the 60s, and now he's talking this called the ironic villa. And as you can see, it's a machine. It's still a machine. It's a machinic architecture. But it's a, it's a villa on wheels. But if you look at the wheels, uh, so it's like columns upside down, and the ionic capital is the wheel of the villa ironic that is a machine that can Moved, okay? And this villa ironic that absor is absorbing energy from space and uh, processing uh, garbage, etc., etc. It's also sort of like a new form, a postmodern form of a space ship. So this is basically the way how it works. And this is the other version of the villa ironic, called also the Mario Palace. Uh, but it's a fantastic caption. And it's really uh, it's a form of uh, totally, uh, uh, I don't know if you need the translation, but it's habitat de fumier. It's part in French, part in English. Uh, it's uh, what comes out of a villa de Monique, so discretion. It's a cabana of Canada, um, and it's a pile of mayor, um, xenophobic. It's a postmodern alternative housing for the average habitant. Ah, ah. So, and these are different versions of a postmodern home sweet home. So it's, a, it's like a terrible, terrible commentary of the end of the avant garde and uh, the, um, the effect of you know, the, the, the postmodern uh, nostalgia and, and discourse about the house. And, this was like, these were like the images that um, were closing the show. And I want to use it also for, to close this lecture. And uh, it's all good. The, the career of uh, Dalek did not finish with that. He's actually still doing things. Uh, but we decided to bracket the show between the very beginning in, in, in Paris and this, um, so I keep saying sarcastic, but also dramatic. Uh, um, Photographs, I don't know, uh, work, works that it does in, uh, in the 80s, which is like the, the moment when the really postmodern dominates uh, um, the culture of Montreal, the architectural culture of Montreal. Okay, I'm stopping here.
uh, uh, despite all the denials of, uh, of Francois, because uh, there is, uh, I, did, I don't know, he's there. Oh yes, he was a friend. But did you take a look at what he did? No. The, the, the conversation is all like that. Or he said, Francois, uh, what do you think? Uh, okay, but uh, your environmental uh, bubble is a womb, is it a girl of a womb? Yes, but you know, I met someone else, but it's this friend. I don't know, Christopher Hyde, he's saying that he's like, a, uh, you know, the anti Antipos are the there. I said, oh, fine, good. So, I mean, it's, the conversation is completely surreal. Um, and that's why at the beginning, as I said, it was like a big challenge for me, for Johan Stalder, and also for Tom Weaver, which is very British. It was the one that really enjoyed me, all this surrealist uh, form of. Um, interaction with, uh, with Francois and how to do research on this uh, amazing uh, person and, 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 you know, and work on his archive and get him to find. We, we never, we were never allowed access to the basement and the attic and the barn. Uh, we, every time we went to see Francois, we, we had a conversation and we say, oh yes, it's true. Um, yes, I have a few postcards and letters from Salvador Dali. Um, come back and I'll show it to you. I said, ah, okay. Um, for example, the, uh, the photographs and all the relationship between Schunk, uh, the photographer that worked with Yves Klan, etc., um, we found out of this piece of the archive a month before the opening of the exhibition that we were doing. So after four years that I was meeting with Francois, I found out that this connection. And so it, it, it's been, you know, amazing. <laughs> so, so in a way, you have also to resist um, interpreting too much. Because uh, everything is permitted in Francois, but I thought you have really to refrain yourself. Because if everything that is permitted, it doesn't make it, you know, so what's the value of interpreting too much? Light bulbs, about 
<laughs> so you can imagine he is somewhere in that class. But, uh, and Phyllis, uh, and before opening the CCA, gave part of her house um, to Francois to use as a gallery space because uh, Francois kept uh, this um, art gallery open for quite uh, some time. First in this drag that lasted for a very short time, and then he kept the gallery open in the house of his son. So, um, so it was like a strange major figure in, in, in the life of Montreal, uh, doing a sort of discourse, uh, you know, halfway between arts, but a certain type of art, and then certain types of arts, that means pop art, uh, but also all the experiments coming from France, uh, Tanguini, the uh, clan, um, but he was also fascinated by poor tech and, and fluxus. And he was in touch with his people. <coughs> and then next to him, you get Melvin Charney that becomes you know, the dominant discourse. And I don't know, that's why I think, I, I think about it. And, and also, it's like the climate in Montreal. If you, if, you, if you speak to people in Montreal, the architects, they also tell, they tell you that uh, really the Olympics, 76, was catastrophic. If and the Expo was the boom um, to the economy, to the, for the city, the open up, they did open up Montreal to the world, etc., etc. The Olympics were like catastrophic. The city took 30 years to get out, to dig themselves out of the hole, <laughs> that uh, economic, etc., uh, etc. Et and in terms of building and architectural discourse, it was very, very so, I don't know. It was also living probably by the atmosphere. But yes, you may also think that uh, we can Yeah. Hold on. 
fast and we're more like closer to kind of scientific like interaction more than artistic and that was more like an aesthetic territory. <coughs>
way to produce it, in a more productive way, certain experiments of 